A huge thank you to EMQX, the enterprise broker, for sponsoring this video. All right, uh, what is OPC part two? Really key elements and how does it work? Take zero. All right, so OPC, uh, we were gonna talk about some key elements and I'm gonna sketch kind of how it works, all right? So remember, uh, from the last video, from the first video, OPC is OLE for process control and OLE is basically how do I make it so that pieces of software that run inside of a framework and the framework in this case is the OPC standard, pieces of software that run inside of a framework, how can I link objects or events from this place in my software or framework to over here? Okay, that's, uh, think about it this way, the best description is, you know, how can I write a piece of software that runs in a Microsoft operating system that can navigate objects that are running in the operating system itself? Things like a file share. You can download many applications that'll allow you to explore files on a thing. You use OLE to do that, right? You use, you use OLE to do all that linking so that you can, I can, I can take a piece of software and I can, I can browse those types of things, okay? So that's the best illustration, okay? So some key elements of OPC. Number one, the OPC Foundation is the group that is basically made up of companies who make OPC products, products that meet the standard, they use those products for really two reasons. Number one, to have their products talk to one another. So Microsoft might make two products, a product I sell to this type of customer and another product, an add-on I might wanna to sell to that customer. And I might use the OPC UA standard to connect those two, to open this product to my other product I'm selling. And I may not use that to make my product, the data from product A, open to a third party product. I may only, I may use it as the underlying uh, protocol and standard for how I'm sharing data between two of my own products. Okay, that's one application. The OPC Foundation is made up of companies who do those types of things. The OPC Foundation is also made up of companies who make third party OPC products. So that is, I may make a product that talks natively to Microsoft's product A over Microsoft's uh, native protocol and then converts to OPC. So using the OPC standard so that another third party OPC client or piece of software can consume that data. Okay. So that's a second application. Okay. That's a second most common type of application. And then the third type of application is I might make a standalone product that's supposed to interoperate with everything, only other OPC things. Okay, so I don't talk any native stuff. All I do is take OPC from over here and expose it to OPC over there, OPC client over there, right? And I'm the server in the middle. Those are your three use cases. So key elements, the first group is the OPC foundation. They're the people who write the standards. They're made up of all the companies that make these products. And there are some end users on there, but the end users have very little say in the outcome. Okay, we know that if we, if we plot the history of the OPC from the 90s until now, the end users are really not driving the development. It's really being driven by the corporations that make up the OPC foundation, and that's why the standard's a fucking mess, okay? Number two, the, uh, another standard. You have OPC Classic and UA standards, okay? So this is, these are the core standards. The second key element are the basic standards for creating information models, creating an OPC server, for organizing the data, for talking to a client, for responding to a client, for keeping connections alive, handling timestamps, all that kind of stuff, okay? So the second piece are the base standards, okay? The OPC UA standard, which came out in the early 2000s, the OPC classic standard was based on COM and DCOM, that that was the underlying technology in the 90s that was predominant in Microsoft products, COM and DCOM. The OPC Classic was based on that technology and it was fairly simple. It was a simple way of organizing data, creating a hierarchy and exposing it to other applications, all right? Interoperability. Again, remember when we talk about OPC, we're talking about process control. How do we do this in industry? How do I take stuff from machines and share it? Microsoft already had their own standards, the you know, use for OLE, that's object linking and embedding, for commercial and consumer products. They already had that. OPC is for machines specifically, for industry specifically. So the second element is the 
the base standards. The common standard now, the one that nearly all products that come out have, is using the OPC UA standard, okay? That standard was originally 13 parts, then you added OPC part 14, which was pub sub, and I don't know how many parts we're at to now, part 20, I think, or something. And then the third piece, so this is the core OPC, OPC UA standard. So these are the second element is the standard itself, and then the last part is companion specs, okay? Companion specifications are offshoots of the, board, the base standard that tell you how to organize data. Uh, the best way to define a, a most companion specs in the UA standard is it's a specification that tells you how to create a user-defined data type for a specific type of equipment. Okay. Now in OPC UA and OPC, they call these information models. They should not call them information models. They should call them data models. They're not information models. The data hasn't been transformed yet. Remember information is transformed data. What they really are is hierarchical data models. That's really what the companion specs create. Again, I don't want to get too technical. This is meant for a broad, but the companion specs are really specifications that tell you how to create a user defined data type. Okay. For a specific type of process. Okay, CNC would be a really good example, or a, a lathe would be a good example, okay? The three key elements that make up what is OPC is the foundation, okay, made up of the companies who make these products, okay? Um, the two base standards, OPC Classic, which is deprecated, you will see this less and less and less, the utilization of it, the OPC UA standard, which we talk about all the time, and then the companion specifications, okay? What I'm gonna do is show you, in a nutshell, the, what the core of the UA standard is, where most OPC UA solutions start, where they start, and then we'll talk a little bit about what makes up the UA standard here in a second. All right, so how does OPC work in general? The common use case, okay? So the common use case in OPC is I have two things. I have an OPC server, okay? And I have an OPC client, okay? The OPC server is the thing that has the data and has the data, and the OPC client is the thing that wants the data. Okay, the OPC UA standard has many, many, many pages of rules for if I'm going to build an OPC server, how do I build it? Okay, so there's components of the UA standard that tell you how to build an OPC server. There's basically for the, the rank and file, here are the things that matter. You have your objects and then you have your, your topics. Okay, topics will be tags. Objects give you part of the hierarchy. How do I get to my thing? and the topics live in a place in the, in the hierarchy, but they can live in multiple places. A topic's also an object, tag object, right? So the standard shows you how to build an OPC server so I can serve out my data. I may have, I may have 100 tags that I've retrieved from a machine that are like temperature and level, and, and I did those over serial communications to that machine. I wrote my own custom driver. I extracted the data from the machine. I've got it running in a piece of software, and now what I wanna do is make that data available to some other piece of software. If I want, I can use the OPC UA standard to create an OPC server, and then I can create an OPC client to extract that data, okay? There are rules to build an OPC client, and there are rules to build an OPC server. And you can use the OPC UA standard to do that. Now, I could also do things like, I could use the companion spec, let's say the 100 tags that I retrieved from my machine. In this case, let's say there's a CNC companion spec. I haven't read them all, not all the companion specs. But let's say I've retrieved data from a CNC machine. Okay, and we have, a, we have a CNC companion spec. I can also take, take the CNC companion spec and I can put in, using the companion spec, the CNC info model. I'm almost certain there'll be one. If, they're, if you're making information models for anything, you, you'd start with CNCs. I could use the CNC information model from that companion spec, if it exists. Vaughn will look it up and tell me if there is one. And I will use the base standard from the UA standard to create my server. And I will use the base standard from the UA standard to build my client. There is a CNC companion spec? Okay, good. I wasn't wrong, there is. So I could use the companion spec for CNC data to create the information model, map the appropriate tags from the 100 that I retrieved from that CNC into a CNC information model using this spec so that I could then 
This client could establish a connection to this server. It could then browse the, the OPC namespace. It could retrieve, it could set up a subscription to the CNC information model. And then the server would update the client about the data inside the CNC information model. And this OPC client would then be connected to a user interface that could monitor the changes of those values and display the data from that CNC, okay? So I know that's messy now, but in a nutshell, that's how OPC UA, were, that's how OPC works in nearly all use cases, okay? So that's a very good example of a OPC use case. That's a great use case right there, okay? What's the problem with, with what I just put on the screen there? You selectively pick components of the specification to build your application. I didn't use all the specification, right? I didn't, I only used the pieces of the spec I needed for the use case, okay? Uh, it's linear integration, right? Data from the machine to my OPC server where I'm gonna convert my data to my OPC client. I have to allow, I have to allow my client permission to connect to my server. I have to open inbound ports to get down there because the connection is instantiated by the client, okay? The response comes from the server, but the connection is instantiated from the client. If my client is at a higher level in the organization, that client has to have permission to talk down to retrieve my data, okay? So I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you, I don't know all the elements of the spec without reading the spec here, but I can, I can give you, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and use Jeff Schrader put, he made a, a satirical diagram on OPC. What is OPC in the stand? And, and I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys that, but I'm gonna do my own thing. So you've got OPC core, okay? So you've got OPC core, which they don't call it core, I, but we're talking about the layperson. You got the core element of OPC, okay? And that is server client. That, that's a thing that's used nearly all the time. And then you've got all these other things. Oh, you put it up there for me. So you've got, well, here are all the things. You've got, you've got HDA, you've got XML DA, you have alarms and events. So auto discovery. Yep. You have auto discovery. Okay. All these elements of the OPC, that core OPC UA spec. Okay. You've got SOAP. Okay. And, and credit to Jeff Schrader, because I'm, I'm looking at Jeff's um, document up here, he kind of put it together in a chart. Payloads, okay, which by the way would be be part of server client. You've got DA. Okay, so you've got all these things. Now, there are, you know, obviously TCP is going to be our, our communication of choice, and we've got UDP, okay? And then we've got all these, we've got other, other elements of the spec, okay? Here's a fundamental problem with what I put on the screen there. If I'm going to build an OPC solution. I want to use OPC UA as my IIoT standard, okay? Well, the first thing I need to do is I would have to learn the standard and then I would need to build, I'd have to build a tool that used the entire standard, okay? And by the way, that tool doesn't exist. There's not a single product on the market that uses every single piece of the standard. Nearly every tool that you buy of the 600 members out there, they're going to be using, they're going to have this piece, okay? They're going to have TCP. You could build a product that's just this. Oh, you would need payloads. So let's do, uh, we'll do payloads up here, right? You know, how do I, I could build a product that only uses the core elements of the UA standard, only uses the elements of TCP so I could communicate and how do I exchange payloads? I could create a product that does that, okay? HDA is how do you transmit um, historical data. So how do I reply with payloads that have historical data in them? This is alarms and events. Uh, this is uh, auto discovery of elements. By the way, that came out in uh, credit to Matt Paris, came out in 2012. And, um, you know, I mean, basically no one implements, right? SOAP or HTTP interfaces, XMLDA, very common in uh, Siemens motion controllers. Like if you go look at the D445s from Siemens, they have an XMLDA server that runs on, on the, the D445. Here's the problem, okay? The problem is, the problem is, is that there's no tool out there that has all these things, 
okay? And I could make a product that only uses a couple of the elements that doesn't work with another product that doesn't use those elements, okay? So one of the fundamental issues with OPC UA is when I said uh, in the live stream that there needs to be elements, more of the OPC UA standard needs to be compulsory. What I'm saying is, is that we, if we're gonna say that OPC UA is an IIoT protocol, that we wanna use it as the core of our IoT infrastructure, then we have to make more elements of the OPC UA standard compulsory. And by the way, this is the OPC Foundation's fault. And when I say the OPC Foundation, I mean the companies, the people who make up the OPC Foundation. Because one of the roles of the OPC Foundation, they have certification committees. So if I make an OPC product, okay, they certify the product before I can put the label on it. And for whatever reason, the OPC Foundation Never, if the goal is interoperability, they're doing a terrible job of creating interoperability. But if your goal is interoperability for products only your members make, okay? And moreover, if the goal is to make interoperability for products that a member makes, so Microsoft wants to use OPC so that my products talk to one another leveraging OPC, but we're not going to go ahead and, you know, we won't, we'll put that in a wrapper and not expose it to third-party applications. The OPC Foundation does a phenomenal job of that, okay? All right, so what is OPC part two, okay? You remember the three elements, the OPC Foundation, the core specifications, the companion specification. I showed you the example of the typical use case, the, the most common use case. If you see OPC, the use case I just showed you is the absolute most common use case you're gonna see. There are many other use cases out there. I don't want that use case I wrote over there, but for the lay person, if you wanna know what is OPC, that's the most common use case. That was my okay. use case. Okay, that's the most common use case. And then remember, why is it that OPC UA, why is it most people don't, there is no product out there that encapsulates everything that is the standard, okay? There's too much technical debt in the standard. There's also conflict. You could, there are pieces of the OPC UA standard that you, you could implement. That's right, where you've got to choose, you got to make a binary choice between one or the other, okay? There's too much technical debt in the application. And the last piece is, if I want to build the OPC UA solution, I'm spending buco, buco dollars. Buco, okay? All right, so that's OPC. Now, let me, let me say this because I, I don't want to make enemies of the OPC Foundation, although I, get, I do take a ton of heat from those guys. I can handle it because I probably know the spec better than they do. What does the OPC Foundation need to do from a consumer perspective? What needs to change, okay? Number one, there needs to be bigger, more voices from the user side, okay? So that is engineers who are using tools made by the 600 plus corporate members. There needs to be more of a voice in writing the specifications and writing the certifications, okay, for those products. Number two, you gotta strip the technical debt out of the existing specification. Number three, you gotta nuke part 14, which is pub sub, we'll talk about in a little bit. You gotta nuke it and start it from scratch. You can't start it from scratch until you strip the technical debt out of the spec. You gotta nuke it and start it from scratch, okay? And I would say, I'd add a fourth piece, okay? The OPC Foundation has to be focused, has to be focused on making it easier for companies to build OPC tools quickly with the singular focus of interoperability of data between unrelated partners, third party to third party, okay? All right, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And now we've reached my favorite part of the video where we get to talk about the sponsor, EMQ, and their fully native cloud managed MQTT messaging service. Uh, go ahead and click get started and you can select the basic or professional for up to a 30 day free trial. It's a 14 day free trial if you select professional. Click create now, select AWS. Go ahead and select 5,000 connections estimating at 99 cents per hour. Click next, click deploy. Then it's gonna go ahead and create your instances for you on Amazon Web Services. It's really cool. And like I said, it's a 14 day free trial for the pro. So click the link in the description to get your free 30 day trial started today. Thank you EMQX for sponsoring this video and thank you guys for watching.